What's up, Daw Nation? Welcome to this episode of In The Daw with Slumberjack breaking down their song, Solid. We're going to be talking about making your hybrid trap track bouncy and groovy. We're going to talk about unique sidechain acts to give you really cool rhythms. And we're going to talk about proper ways to mix and master your sub. So make sure to stay tuned for that, as well as many other things that we're going to talk about in this episode. And we're going to start right now. I want to welcome you to this episode of In The Dot. We are honored to be able to have Slumberjack with all of our glasses on here. Don't worry, we're going to explain that in a minute. But gentlemen, Morgan and Fletcher, how are you guys doing today? I would yeah. be lying if I didn't set my alarm for this, but uh, we're doing great. Brendan has glasses, Fletcher had glasses, so Morgan got glasses, so I got glasses. So Multiplier got glasses, Multiplier wears his glasses at night. Thank you, Multiplier. You need to be wearing glasses to watch this episode. And we're going to be breaking down their song, Solid, that they did with Troy Boy. Troy Boy couldn't make it today. What the heck are you doing, man? What you doing? <laughs> Probably getting ready for his show at the Nova tonight. That's a good point. <laughs> That's fair. All right. He can miss it for that. A couple of announcements before we get started. This is a companion podcast to our podcast, Behind the Daw, where we interview music producers, musicians, artists, music industry experts on an emotional, philosophical, and artistic basis. If you are interested in that, I got to take these off. They're fogging up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, anyway, so if you're interested in that, there is a link down in the description. Go ahead and click on that. Also, there is a link in the description for the Patreon. If you want to make sure that we can keep bringing these interviews to you forever for free, go ahead and check that out. It's a dollar a month, plus you get access to a private Discord community. It's lovely. Next link in the description is for suggestions. If you want to suggest someone to come on the show, what are you doing? Why are you here? Go click on it. Also, if you want private lessons in music production, there's a link down there for that. If you want to enter to win a free 20 minute consultation for social media marketing, go ahead and click on that. By the way, our winner for this week is Taylor Nickel. Taylor, hit me up. We'll get you all set up. And we're giving away a Slumberjack style lead rack that sounds similar to the one used in this song. Sounds like this. Again, it's not the exact same as the one that is used in this song, but it's similar. So if you want it, there is a link in the description. And then finally, the last thing I want to mention is there has been some crazy fires down in uh, California right now. And one of the producers that watches the show is, is really tragic. His entire house got burned down. Literally everything he owns is gone. And so he is doing a PayPal, a donation PayPal. So if you could go help him out, help out a fellow producer, that would, that would just mean the world. You know, that's, that's what we're all about, just helping each other out. So go ahead. There's a link in the description for that but with all that out of the way let's get into this let's get into the music production side so mr plier that is me the big the big standout question is how you made the main lead which i'm guessing is the slumber synth it kind of sounds like a crazy resonator thing this is a crazy one we're gonna this is our signature sound i i think if you guys have been following us we use this at our um in our touched bootleg bootleg we did of what's or not's touched and what we're gonna do because this is very very proprietary we're just gonna flash it real quick it's it's a massive thing we're gonna flash it really quickly there you go <laughs> <laughs> and then everything else is like if you look at how we process our sounds okay it's really it's it's fairly simple i'll flash it again one more time we we keep things really simple and you're right there is a frequency shifter going on right here and that's automated throughout the track. This is a sound that we, we use quite often, right? We also use it in one of our records uh, called Ra. And we, it's just, everything is post-processing. So if you have a look over here too, I think it's very similar to what a lot of producers are doing. We hardly quantize, like, I, I think at least the second note. So it feels like it's delayed, but everything else is pretty on point. Also with the delay here, we have a full track delay of 12 milliseconds. Just so that, that just to have that there it's so like so this if you uh down down in this section in the bottom right hand right hand corner of the screen i'm terrible with left and rights there is this little button i think it says d, d. at the bottom yeah and if you s smack that on you get uh this option yeah, on every it. track for a track delay and what it's actually used for is when you're using i think it's, it's for when you're using hardware and you need to put in a delay, a, compensation. A delay yeah. compensation to make sure everything's in time. But we use it creatively by adding, you know, for example, an extra 12, second, 12 milliseconds on this channel so that everything in that channel gets pushed back without having to move the MIDI clips or anything. And what it does is it gives it this delayed, swaggy feel. And we often do it with hi-hats as well. It just It's kind of like adding swing, but it's not swing. It's, it's just an overall delay. And it gives it this really cool, swaggy feeling that, that makes it, have that off time feeling without being too outrageous. 
it picks like you know a delay on the track and go full wet and then link it up and then then you can you know change that the milliseconds but i just sometimes i just do that i know we 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 keep it messy sometimes i feel like it's better create creatively i don't think i've ever seen someone on the show that's actually utilized that before that's such a great idea as far as like kind of creating that swing right yeah. yeah another thing that is cool about the sound is um we like to play with midi note length like it's very very important for this for the vibe for example if you listen to like uh, that long one and then the short one and then the long one but so without having to actually re- release as well. i believe there's probably automation on that as well but if you um, there we go man, there's a lot of automation but okay so you can see here the attack for like that one note we bump up the attack because shorter notes while the midi note is playing here um but just by doing small things like that you can improve the rhythm uh and get variation in the sound without having to automate anything in terms of like the frequency spectrum of of the sound or anything it just it just is purely a rhythmic thing with we automate attack. amplitude yeah amplitude so you can see throughout the whole throughout the whole channel that attack is being automated on that synth as it as it plays to give it uh variation yeah that's a we we do we do this a lot like for, uh decay decay time for reverb too just so it feels like it's moving back and forth in the in the um sound stage and then there's also, I guess, yeah, Fletcher was talking about attack. And I think we also have, not just attack. Yeah, there you go. We got Valhalla room. We got frequency shifter moving around too. There we go. Yeah. So that makes it even twangier for this part. There are times where we bounce the master and we realize that like, it doesn't sound as good. So we rebounce it again. I mean, the smarter way would be to freeze it and to select precisely what parts you need. But for us, um, we like the idea of, having a little bit of uncertainty in our tracks. Like even even like, you know, months later on when you ask us how we make something, we might have to like delve really deep to remember. <laughs> because half the time we let uh, I guess the power of randomization, you know, create something for us. So what just to clarify what he's talking about there is because a lot of the the effects and stuff that we're running are, are on not they're not retriggering. They're yeah. just caught kind of like on these random LFOs. So every time you play the track the LFO is going to be at a slightly different point and all the different effects are going to interact with each other differently. So the sound comes out differently every time you play through. So sometimes we have to like play it a bunch of times until we find one we like, and then we have to like freeze that one hmm. or, or we like, I believe it even changes every time you bounce the master and sometimes yeah, we just have to rebound yeah, it to, to, to get a better version of like the interaction between the, the plugins. But then, you know, there are moments where you bounce a version and you hear it, you'd be like, whoa, <clears> you know, I'm never going to get that. Again, because of all the, you know, LFOs and all the stuff that we're, we're automating, um, you know, they, there's what the stars would align and you'll never probably get that moment again because you just don't know how to time it. It's like the perfect syncopation of everything that is about to go wrong. And it became correct. Almost all of the songs that I've heard of yours, a signature bounciness to everything. It's almost as if like a bouncy ball is like hitting the floor, coming back up, hitting the floor again. Everything is very in sync with your sub, with your lead, the hats. And, and I know you, you kind of answered that with the delay, but what are some of the other things that make your song so crispy and bouncy? If I, I don't really know how else to describe it. The, uh, the word crispy, uh, I think, uh, comes from, and I, I think what you mean here is like the crunchiness of, of like the sounds. And that I generally attribute to having nice high frequencies which we get just by using saturation so on our drums we always use well it kind of sucks now that live 10 i mean i'm stoked about drum bus <laughs> like live 10 brought out this this new plugin called right drum here. bus which sounds so good that you can literally just put it on your drum bus and it sounds and like it's mixed it makes it sound amazing whereas before in live nine we pr- pr- prided ourselves on all our little secrets of distorting the drums and stuff. And now drum bus is so good that you just put that on and it kind of takes the, the, the finesse out of it. Yeah. But uh, we're not complaining. I mean, you know, now everybody. everyone has access to like really good um, drum mixing. But basically the crispiness is just from overdrive. Uh, I pretty much overdrive like every sound, uh, probably in it too, too much. And our mixing engineer is like, you gotta well, you guys got to like pull down the the source on this one yeah but because I, I got no more room to work with <laughs> like especially on the drums like crispy and crunchy comes from uh, if i open the kicks here you'll see there's there tons go. of kicks to answer your question about bounciness as well i was looking at this project again and 
one of the snares <clears throat> will be delayed. So let me just pull up the snare here and see that that's supposed to hit right here. Yeah, that's very far. That's, that's an OCD thing. Uh, if oh, I yeah, were to put it back sounds. here, boom, it's right. So that's really it. just a little bit, just just out of the pocket. Or some people may say it's in the pocket. You uh, you can really hear the saturation when you hear the drums soloed. Yeah, yeah okay, I, I, so I can totally tell you're talking about. And also the fact that the there's layers. so many layers. So we'll um, show it you just what clips how we layer through like Ableton's internal uh, limiting, and like these kicks are a lot of these kicks are already clipped as well. So we like, pick this one. That's like the main, and then the crispiness. Um, actually, for most of this, for specifically this record, mm. the crispiness was achieved by just very meticulous layering. So obviously, for this this bit, main kick, um, it's a it's a body of the kick, and then there's the crush kick, which is basically almost like the air. Uh, it all, almost feels like a a taiko, where it's like a huge membrane, like a skin membrane, and then you got your that's just for a dunk. I mean, because that's it, it, it's different from your typical EDM. Kick. That's not on every kick. You can see every kick is like almost got a different yeah makeup. Like almost every, see the, these are all the kicks, but they're being layered differently, and that's also different from this guy. So and we got a crowd clap. So all together, but we like to do that. Yeah, so it, that creates the bounce. So not every kick is the same. What a kick could be longer, a kick could be shorter, it could be tighter. Um, it could have, it, it could not have the space, like the, the 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 space that you feel like it's in. So it could hit you in the center, it could hit you on the side, and it's very important to sit down and really work on the loop until the drums itself could sing. So the way Fletcher and I, I like, love that. That's a cool way to put it. Yeah, the, the way Fletcher and I like to work with drums is if you just solo the drums and you play it, if it makes you dance, then half your work is done. Like, I'm dancing, dude. I'm dancing. Right? Troy is really, really good at um, the hi-hat game. The hi-hat's actually given... Uh, he actually sent us a hi-hat, and that worked so <clears throat> well. So this one here, the wonky hat, and it's flanged as well. So we didn't do anything to this then because he sent it to us the way it is. And just listen to it. His hi-hats are really weird because there's limited options for where you can put them. You can do 16th time, you can do 8th time, you can do quarter time, and it's just how you switch between those different timings gives the rhythm. But somehow Troy just knows it, yeah. exactly when to make him go fast and when to make him go slow. And you almost do that 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 dance that he does when you're like... When you, you guys know the Troy Boy dance on stage, right? Yeah, so, <laughs> so he nails it. It's amazing. And, and the flanging is also really, really... Uh, helpful to give it's you animated that vibe. It but you can see here even animated. the hat see how delayed the hat is from from the grid um so we we would do that by using the delay over here normally but he just obviously did that within the stem and then and even it, on left right you us. can see that on the left and right he delays it to to make it feel like it's wider so it doesn't occupy everything in the center right that's called the harsh effect when your left channel and your right channel are delayed in reference to each other it makes the sound sound super wide because your ears hear them differently and doesn't your brain doesn't perceive it as one sound. It perceives it as two different sounds coming from either side, so therefore it sounds really wide. And it might can, actually be a different sample too. That sneaky guy. It looks different. Oh, Kirk is flange. Yeah. That's why. Yeah, there you go. I'll catch you guys later. Very nice to meet you too. Now the real interview can begin. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I got a question for you guys. So, you know, speaking about Troy Boy, so what was everyone's kind of, place in here you know like what did you guys do and specifically what did each of you do and then what did troy do so we went on tour together last <clears> last year <throat> and we we're on a tour bus and he invited us in and we were playing uh at, at the justice league game and then he was showing us this beat that he's working on uh, it's not a beat it was just an idea basically he had this So you can hear he's like almost whistling and singing at the same time, like yeah. at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has that. And then we wanted the melody to come up even more. Then we're on the bus. So I chopped up this. Uh, it's from a, the cashmere pack on um, Splice. I just got to kind of match what he's doing. 
but that took a long time. But we eventually got there. And then from there on, he sent us the hi-hats. I think he had a basic beat going on. We just came up with the drop because the drop was very, it's similar to the whistle. The drop is the same melody as the whistle. It's the same melody <clears throat> with a different sound. We took it and we probably finished it in, we, we were touring in China at the time and we finished it there and sent it back to him. And we're like, I think this is done. And he, he approved it. And it was like, yeah, actually this is done. He started playing it out. We started playing it out for months now. That's when we know it's a good track, I feel. When you collaborate with someone and it happens literally in one session. And there's minimal work you have to do to it. You don't have to like save it, you know? It's it, it's great to start with. Completely not music production related. If anyone wants to learn how to do that, the, the little whistle thing. So you whistle and then you also hum at the same time. What's that body channel? Body is the word we use to group all our like mid-range synths and stuff that that's none. not necessarily chords. Like we're very... We like to be very neat with our project. So we always have drums at the top in a big group. We always have bass underneath, always in blue. And then always in chords blue. is always a channel because we have these like slumbery chord things that we... Yeah, we always have these slumber jacky like distorted chord sounds. Body is just kind of like the synths and everything else. So it's this sound that you hear in the track. So that's based on like a, a sample phonics loop that we got from there. Uh, they have this online platform called Noise. It's kind of like splice sounds. Basically, we chucked it through a bunch of distortion, um, decapitator. We repitched it. We like added a bunch of. It's you're not seeing everything that's going on here because it's been affected and then bounced to audio and then affected and then bounced to audio again to give it that really horrible sound. But basically, the main effects that you're hearing on it are like a pitch wobble which uh, I'm not sure. We might have done that with Frequency Shifter or... Or maybe just in the sample alone. Or maybe in the sample really alone, just it. done the automation on the pitch. A lot of distortion. So I really like vinyl distortion. I think it has a super nice sound. And by tweaking this one here, it's kind of like the vinyl distortion, yeah. it distorts only past a certain volume. So it's almost like the distortion turns on and off at certain parts randomly, uh, which gets this really nice effect. Oh, and then obviously Decapitator. And then I believe this is OTT because... You got to do OTT sometimes. It's lay. Oh, this one isn't, isn't even on. So that's probably like the old one where it was. Bounced, no, that's probably more. That's that's the one that's super. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Morgan did this originally, yeah. and the pitch the pitch warping was way too much, and we had to pull it back just to make the melody make a bit more sense. In your drop, so I know we talked about you know the main lead that was in the drop, but in your drop and on the downbeat, like the 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 first downbeat. Well, I guess most yes. of the downbeats what's that sound that's going on there because it's different than so the that's mode. being processed as well so basically we've been trying it's to, to us fletch and myself it's like the hallmark of like making bass is trying to copy guys like noisia the ideas were coming so quickly for this track we did we didn't want to have to sit down and get too technical in designing a sound so we quickly went on splice and found a couple of like respaces and neuro funk style you know super clip bass and we found this one and it's kind of it's kind of cool but it's affected as well and we've already resampled a couple of times but we'll just show you how it sounds and, and there's a bit of groove to it because it's also off um off grid like so i'll play it now yeah so this one here is literally just a sample that we found so if i would play the whole thing out it's, it's kind of gross actually so we just got the beginning and actually what we're doing to get the the rhythm uh, you can see already that it's like off time there's the grid and there's where the second hit comes in but if we look at the automation on utility here we actually just used a volume automation to make it uh to change the attack and release of the sound to get that more choppy sound and then the first time it's two the second time i think it's like yep three it's times, like yep. but it's like uh, yeah it's, it's um, totally off grid i think also right at the start that complements the sound that, that we often will put like let me see if we did it here like a white noise. There you go. Something. Yeah, yeah white, white noise. noise. So just it's, like we learned this from big room. Just a, a, this is a big room thing. Right on the drop, just just put that. And that just makes it sound like everything's clipping when when it first drops because that white noise sound is basically like distortion. So it, and when you combine it with the kick, you get this like Yeah. So the white noise, like quick white noise at the first beat of the drop gives it that that kind of like clippy Actually, uh, um, sound. we got a, yeah, it's a shout out to Martin of Noisia for actually showing us that like in 2015, we were, we were fortunate enough to hang out on this 
thing <clears> on the on the in Sydney. Uh, it's like a floating bar, and we're all just seasick. But I had to ask a question. I was like, "How do you guys achieve a clipping sound without actually clipping?" And he was like, "Well, you know, clipping is basically just everything hitting and you know, pulling itself at the top of the 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 what do you call the signal chain." So white noise is basically that. So you can emulate that using white noise. So ever since then, I guess it's the same as people using crash on the first drop, but we want that really flat, like like bang sound. So the white noise has the most uniform across all frequencies. Obviously, we high pass it, so it's not going to clash or phase with the, the the low end. It's just a little effect that we we do now and again. Kind of so circling back to that thing you mentioned, so it reminds me of, I can't remember who it was in, in the door, but they were doing a similar thing with their super saws, and then instead of distorting them, they'd have like a nice white noise layer on the top, so it was like the same yeah. result, but in, in a way that was much more pleasing to the ear than horrible aliasing and stuff. Yeah, and you get to you get to control precisely, yeah. you know, you have you have the EQ curve. <laughs> if you really want like the 18K to come out, you can do that. Yeah, yeah but we do that with our super saws on top of before yeah. distorting it again. You, you get then, then then you get really careful with the distortion. When I make sub heavy songs like this, I can never get that freaking sub to just pound and sit in the right place. And then especially when I start mastering it then the, the sub just gets all just distorted to crap and so what what do you guys what do you suggest to not only make it stand out but to make that thing punch super hard basically subs are all about harmonic uh harmonics so like your 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 bass i mean firstly it depends on your song key so we write between mostly f, bangers, f to right? g sharp for bangers because F hits at, I think it's 44 hertz. Yeah. And that is just the sweet spot. Some people say G, like dubstep guys would say F sharp and G is the sweet spot. But then I was talking to Quix uh, yesterday. So shout out Quix, who was on also. Oh, the yeah, Joe, no. I love um, that guy. To, to, to him, he finds solace in E flat, which is very low. You know, very it's very it's, it's very low. But um, Fletcher and myself, I think we've, um, through our experience in playing, we find it, it's better to be safe at F. And then if you look at the uh, the EQ8 down here, actually, let me just pop this bad boy up. So you can see there's like three peaks here. This is your fundamental. This is your uh, your, second. your second one. That's and then first. this is, sorry, this is your first. And then this is the, the third harmonic. So we like to have this sort of U shape where the, the third harmonic is a little bit higher and the second harmonic is a little bit lower. And then all this stuff up here just depends on how growly, as well how growly you want it to be. Sometimes we will... Um, take uh, all of these this things getting in the way sometimes we'll take like a thing like this and just soften up that top end but the most important for the punch is these ones here and um you can you just want to tune these three harmonics either using eq or like often if it's we we do our, our basic bass in uh in massive but uh often oh, i turned it off Often uh, we will like add a, a voice plus 12 and a voice plus 19 semitones and that gives you those three harmonics nicely um, and you can tune the levels by changing the level of each oscillator. One, one of the reasons we choose to have that first order harmonics a little bit lower is because usually um, around the 100 hertz region is where your kick hits the nicest. So a lot of people, I guess, would make the sound and then EQ it later. But instead of EQing, I just make the sound the way I want it to sound. So I don't have to EQ it. Then I won't have to duck this one out. So my kick can sit there. It's not because like we, we don't want him to be, to have that wall out and then EQ it later anyway. So we have that U sound that it's only provided if you're writing in a key that is close to where your kick is. But for songs that I've seen songs that are written in C sharp, and that's a low C sharp, and that would be about right there, like 35 hertz. So maybe in headphones, like if you're listening to like um, Beats headphones where they're super bass, have, you can hear that frequency. But maybe at a, at a club or a festival where the sub rolls off at 40 or 40, 44 hertz, you might lose that. So then if we really have to write a song in C sharp, I would say that the first harmonic should be higher than the fundamental, just in case you get to a venue that couldn't produce the 35, it could produce the 70. So the double of that, just to be safe. But you see 70, it's a quite a while away from maybe, right? Yeah, so you can have your kick sitting there without touching 70 because it's quite a while it's I quite see, far i see what you're saying i should ask do you guys master your own tracks no we no. master other people's tracks but we never master our own well basically we listen to this song thousands of times in the process of making it and when it comes time to master 
Uh, we're very biased Jeez. and we know because we know so well what it's supposed to sound like, our perspective of the sounds is completely distorted because we know what is there. So we're listening for it. Whereas if you come in with fresh ears, you might, you could easily tell that a certain sound is too quiet because we know that sounds there because we made it, we put it there and we're listening for it. But uh, our mix and master engineer will come in and tell us that a it's specific synth, well. he can hardly even hear it because he, uh, because he's never heard the song before. So we actually, we do like a stem master. So we'll send like drums, bass, synth, vocal, about eight, six, like to eight, six to eight channels or, or however many. Uh, and then he'll mix those channels and, and then apply a master. Okay. For the masters that you do for other people, how do you make sure, you know, if it's, if it's a sub heavy track that you don't destroy the crap out of it when you're, when you're living? Well, it? we keep the sub low. Here's the, I, I find it counterintuitive, but it works. The more you try to push the sub into a limiter, the more <laughs> it's going to leak into the mid range area. But if you, just bring the sub a little bit lower and focus on the mid range. People would think it's sub heavy, but it's not. I mean, the key is to use a multi band first as well. So yeah. we use a multi band uh, limiter or multi band compressor to control the sub level first before we send it into a main limiter. Because obviously, a main limiter acts on the whole track at once. So if any one element, the sub, the mids, the highs, if any one element triggers the limiter, it's going to it's going to compress everything down. So if your sub super loud and there's a lot of energy in the sub, that's going to start tripping the limiter and it's going to bring the, the rest of the track's volume down. It's going to limit it. So we, we pull the sub down and that lets the limiter work harder on the rest of the track. Once you get people dancing off any groove, like if you have just a simple 808 and you can make people dance just with a, like your 808 kit, then yeah, half your work is done. And then later on, once the skeleton is done, you, you can tweak the little like weird wideness that you want and that weird little crunch at the top per like second and a half kick. Would you guys like our feedback on your track? Yes. Yeah, yeah let's go. <laughs> That's all, oh, man. I'm... This is good. This is a good track. You guys did a good thing here. This is really, really awesome. As far as making anything better, I don't know if I can, ah, because my all of my, uh, the things that came to my mind that, would, that I thought would make it better was just completely... It's just all taste. It's just all taste. And so there's nothing, there's nothing that's like inherently wrong. Like, oh, make sure you do that, you know, next time. But if I had to say a taste fade feedback kind of a thing was when you showed that little neurofunk thing in there, like, like I got cold chills. I was like, oh, if there was a little bit more of that in there, but still keeping it like, like the kind of the trappy, the bouncy thing. I'm like, oh, like kind of like a trappy neurofunk. Oh my gosh. Like, yeah, dude, that would be, that's a good idea. Actually, a neurofunk, a trappy trap, neurofunk trap. thing. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe, it might be garbage, but it was just something that came up, but there was something. Oh yeah. Okay. So when you guys were talking about, uh, here's, here's some cool advice for you. This is really, really cool. I saw this on a tutorial once. Um, there's a function that you can do inside of Ableton. This kind of helps you create and like test grooves. So what you can do is you can route audio a certain way in Ableton to your side chain compressor so that you can browse your samples in your in your sample library and have it activating your side chain so that it, the side chain will be moving to the samples so they can kind of give you an idea for different grooves and different you know like kind of like bounces and stuff does that make sense is, oh. that, is that in that is that right here you, interesting i'm sure we can look into that yeah you yeah, need to look into cool. it that's cool I have no idea how to tell you how to do it. If, uh, if anyone is interested, Point Blank is the, the, the music production school is the one who came out with that. It's really good. Like I've never seen anything like that. That's like almost. So you're saying we can browse the samples and the loops and it's playing in time. It's playing, it's playing in, not only is it playing in time, but it's activating the side chain. So like, for example, let's say that you had a sub, you know, a little a saturated sub and you had the side chain on that sub. What you can do is you can route it to your browser library so that when you're going through your browser library, it'll duck the, the sub in, in whatever way that the, the, the sample is, basically. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 This was a really good song. This is a really good song. I'm not going to roast you. you. You do not deserve to be roasted. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that melody would work really well with other genres as well. So I don't know how many people are still doing it, but I always quite like it when people take like one genre like this and then in the second drop, they switch it up to a different BPM and to a whole different genre. So like oh, me personally, I think that lead melody would work really great with Mumba Tom, um, that kind of 110 BPM. Yeah, we are dent, dent um, 10 more BPMs and we're at 100 already. I think it's a sign of a good melody if, you know, we all always, well, I'm not fantastic at piano, but Morgan is, and 
you'll always play our melodies on the keys. And yes. if it works as an acoustic, you know, uh, arrangement arrangement with it on the piano, then you know it's going to be a good melody. And it doesn't have to be like we try to pick melodies that aren't specific to the genre, just because that means that. It's going to stick in your head a lot more. It's great. We, for we want that 20 years down the line, Slumberjack classic hits, the golden yeah. era. Yeah, I thought the method was really, really good. So, yeah, I think it could Thanks. be pretty much any genre. I think we learned that also off like, and someone was, I can't remember which producer was selling us. You know, at the moment, you go to any like dance EDM show, and, you know, we have like crazy productions in terms of like sonically and visually. And then I think uh, there was this one time someone went to an Ed Sheeran show, and it was massive, and he just had a guitar, a stool, and a mic, right? So the melody and the song is great, and it captivated thousands of people. And, and I guess that's also the, the standard that um, I think every musician should go for, is if it's memorable just with its main melody, then you're winning. Yeah, yeah definitely. I, I mean, you could always like revisit it in a few years, like Noisier have with their, with their old tracks, and I think yeah, yeah so, so, certainly that main melody, uh, I feel like has that potential. So. Acoustic VIP. All right, that sounds good. Yeah, the acoustic VIP, but you can't do it on a piano. You're going to have to like pick like a trombone or something, you know, like, just something. A or, or like a harmonica or something, really. That. An accordion, anything yeah. with a reed. But you can keep the sub bass. Yeah. You can, you, that, that is one element you can keep in there. <laughs> okay, we'll keep the sub bass. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Other than that, guys, thank you so much for coming on the show. Did you guys have a good time? Yeah, thanks for having us, man. Thank you. Hey, Daw Nation. Hope you enjoyed this episode of In the Daw with Slumberjack. Breaking down their song, solid. If you enjoyed this episode, please let us know down in the comments. Also, please subscribe and click the little notification bell so that you get notified every time we release an episode. If you are interested in the Patreon, giving suggestions for artists to come on the show, having private lessons in electronic music production or social media marketing, or entering the free giveaway for the social media marketing consultation, there is a link down in the description for all those things. And there is a link in the description so that you can download that preset, this one right here, for free. So go ahead, click on those. It's simple, it's easy. Go ahead and do that. And then finally, I just want to suggest for you to check out these episodes that are popping up on the screen right here. They are related to this type of music if you're into making this type of music. So with all that out of the way, Daw Nation, make sure to check these out. Make sure to check out Behind the Daw and the links in the description. And you have a fantastic day, and we'll see you next time on In the Daw.